All right, great. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the HFI Kenya Tech Lunch for January 21st, 2021. Uh, today's Tech Lunch is going to be on biomass carbonization. This is part two in our series on carbonization and char making uh, for the HFI Kenya program. So in today's Tech Lunch, we're going to do a quick talk about a a first uh, refresh on pyrolysis and torrefaction. We talked a little bit about those uh, during the last tech lunch. We just want to kind of uh, refamiliarize ourselves with those terms and technologies. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the common char making technologies or carbonization technologies. So I'll take us through a few examples. So there's a lot of different methods for making char. Some are relatively basic um, methods like the pit and the drum, and then some reaching more advanced um, industrial or commercial level of char making. So there's a wide spectrum, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, both ends of the spectrum. We're going to continue in the next month's Tech Lunch to talk about some recent and new advances. So first, just to refresh, when we talk about carbonization, um, torrefaction, char making, really all of these that we're talking about are part of a series or a, a category of, of thermal processes called pyrolysis. So last time we talked a little bit about what is pyrolysis. And I presented this idea of taking our fuel particle through different stages of conversion at, as it heats up. The first one being drying, drying, where the raw fuel particle loses its moisture. The second one being devolatilization, or this is the term we use for pyrolysis in this diagram. And that's when we uh, remove tars and volatile matter. So remember back to our first tech lunch, we talked about biomass composition. Volatile matter is a big part of all biomass. And in this case, most of that is removed during pyrolysis, which leads, uh, leaves us with char. And that's the carbon rich residue after drying and pyrolysis. And that's really what we're going for in our processes is trying to make as much char as possible into a high enough quality. Now, if we take that on to gasification or combustion, um, we produce some other things like gases or heat in the case of combustion. And in the end, we're left with just a little bit of ash, hopefully. So you can see visually as we take you through a few different stages of pyrolysis. In this case, we're looking at mild pyrolysis or torrefaction. Um, so you can see in, uh, as temperature goes up, you can visually see that uh, the level of devolatilization, devolatilization has gone up. and we're left with uh, more char, basically. So a few terms just to refresh, combustion. I think we're all pretty familiar with that. That's the reaction of a fuel with oxygen to produce heat. Um, pyrolysis is the degradation of a fuel in an inert environment, so without oxygen at an elevated temperature. And then torrefaction is a term that you might hear more uh, recently, this is basically a mild pyrolysis, so lower temperature pyrolysis. It's generally a little bit slower, it takes time to convert uh, the material, and it's really used for drying and densification of feedstocks, energy densification especially. You can think of it like light roast versus dark roast. And then an important term that we use quite a bit is yield, and this is a an indicator of the performance of our pyrolysis or torrefaction process. And so it gives a, the yield is the amount of product that's remaining after a process. So we say a lot of times that this kiln has a char yield of 15 kilograms per 100 kilogram of feedstock. Pyrolysis has a big in, uh, dependence on temperature and the amount of char that we can make uh, really depends on temperature. So this chart is uh, from some experiments uh, by this group. I have a link down here. And they basically show that 
as the temperature goes up, the mass of the original um, the mass of the original material decreases. So that's the triangle and the um, diamonds. And the crosses and the squares are the yield, the fixed carbon content. So we lose mass and our fixed carbon goes up with temperature. So typically we're losing a lot of mass up to about 500 C. So that's our mostly our volatile material coming out up to that point. And then the rest are maybe some heavier volatiles or uh, other components, but we're really trying to get as, in this case, if we were trying to maximize fixed carbon content, then we would really drive the temperature up as high as possible while maintaining an inert environment. And these are actually uh, evaluations from um, a mound kiln technique. So I thought that was, this was really interesting just to sh really drive home that temperature dependence of pyrolysis. So we'll, we'll go through a few different types of um, char making methods now, which use pyrolysis. The most basic one we're probably all familiar with is earthen kilns. So here in the picture, you can see some people um, operating earth mound kilns. Basic premise here is that wood is harvested, reduced in size to small pieces and then piled up ignited, and then covered in soil. Underneath the soil, oxygen isn't allowed to enter or maybe only in a few uh, select locations. And therefore, the, the pile smolders and a lot of char is, uh, uh, char is produced, maybe not a lot. Uh, these typically aren't very efficient, but they're low capital costs and they are relatively easy to operate or a person can be trained to operate them. Um, you, they work best with large feedstocks, so like firewood in this case. Um, they can have a range of yields, kind of depending, I think, in large part on the skill level of the operator. And there's some minor improvements that you can make, like adding a chimney um, uh, and some other methods for improving the yield. So some examples of the earth mound kiln, the earth pit kiln. Drum kilns are another category uh, that are quite popular. So you can see a couple of different designs here, one with a chimney and another one without. Um, these have basically similar levels of char yield as an earth mound kiln could. The volume is a lot lower, you'll notice that. And these are typically made just from refuse or discarded uh, oil drums. So they have little capital cost and training, which is an advantage. Um, they produce relatively small, small amounts of char during each batch. They're batch operated, just like the earth mound. You load a batch of feedstock, fire that, produce char, cool it, empty the char, and then um, start again. Uh, the performance, again, depends on the skill of the operator. Knowing when to cover and quench uh, the reaction is, takes a, a good amount of practice and that'll actually have a big effect on your char yield. They're nice because you can operate them with a variety of feedstocks. So agricultural residues like maize cobs, sugarcane bagasse, even uh, peanut or groundnut shells, um, coconut shells work uh, well in drum kilns. So a couple examples here are the D-Lab kiln, uh, which doesn't have a chimney, has some bigger holes on the bottom, and then the RT style drum kiln, which uses a chimney and has smaller holes on the bottom to allow a little bit of air in. Um, the T LUD is another example. Uh, so I have a photo here of one of those. Um, T L U D stands for top lit up draft. Um, so it means that we light the kiln, light the material from the top, and then air flows up as well as the gases and flame are flowing up through the reactor. And the flame itself is actually traveling down. Um, so there's a downward motion, downward movement of the flame front and the heat and an upward movement of air and gas. So these are a bit higher in yield, um, sometimes 20 to 30% based on what I've seen. 
that improvement comes in part because actually the drum itself or the inner re container is insulated on the outside with maybe fiberglass or um, some low density material vermiculite or something else. Uh, these can be operated, I, I call it semi-continuously. And so in the picture, you'll see um, a system that actually uses the heat from the fire to dry briquettes that are made from the char. And semi-continuous operations means that you can continuously produce heat by swapping in and out uh, two drums. So as you're filling up one drum and preparing to light it, the other one is actually firing. And once that one is complete, then you can light and set the new drum uh, so that the heat can be captured in this case. Uh, but essentially it's a batch loaded operation um, from the perspective of the drum. They're flexible in terms of feedstock. So in this case, I think the one we're looking at is uh, with coconut shells, but uh, other materials can be used like drum kiln. You can add heat recovery. So this is a tunnel dryer along the side um, in this unit. And the one I'm showing here is the Otago t uh, which is used in uh, by Khmer Green Charcoal in Cambodia. Uh, retort carbonization is another broad class of carbonizers um, and char making. Retort means that we actually capture the heat uh, that's being generated in order to drive further drive the pyrolysis of the material in the carbonizer. So uh, this is a design uh, which has become fairly common called the Atom Retort. It was developed by a German gentleman named Chris Adam. And uh, we can't really see it in this picture here, but there's uh, essentially a mechanism for the gases produced during pyrolysis to then flow through a firebox, ignite, and supply some heat back into the, um, the raw biomass material that's carbonizing. So there's a heat recovery component, which is really attractive because that actually can help improve our yields and uh, cut down on um, the ash content and the losses. They can be made out of bricks or steel, but usually, yeah, not an earthen construction and not a simple, you know, recovered material like the drum. A little bit more sophisticated construction. Twenty to thirty percent yield again on the higher side. Um, there may be some cases where it's higher, but these are the numbers that I was able to find. And uh, limited generally to large, large feedstock because we need the pyrolysis gases to easily be able to flow through and out of the um, reaction area so that they can enter that firebox and ignite combust. So one common example is the atom retort. There's a lot of uses of this uh, earlier on in, in a lot of industry, coal and petroleum refining use retort uh, pyrolysis. Um, but this is probably the most common design for char making. Another class is called continuous carbonizers. And I have one example here, but these are essentially carbonizers that can be run for long duration, continuously feeding in raw material, in this case from the top, and removing char after it's been converted um, from the bottom here. So one example is gasification with char co-production. So this is actually a husk fixed bed gasifier. So the gasifier, what that means is our actual target is to make gas, something like natural gas or um, CNG, something like that, which we can then use for a variety of purposes, like say electricity gener generation. But at the same time, we're gonna end up making some char. So actually this plant here, I believe is making electricity primarily and then producing quite a lot of char uh, as well. So depending on how you set up your gasifier, you can produce more char or less char, but typically they're made to target gas production and not char. So the yields of char could be on the lower side. Um, you can co-produce electricity or heat, which could be useful, say, in your briquette factory or for drying. 
Um, these tend to be very specific on the feedstock, especially if you're targeting a specific yield of char or gas. Um, typically, you'll tune the geometry and the, the amount of air that's entering the reactor, the timing, the flow rates um, for a specific feedstock, and then only use that feedstock. So a few examples are the husk fixed bed gasifier. So this is in use in Uganda, at least by ADAPT Plus and probably some others. There's one called the rotary hearth kiln, which I'm going to talk about during the next tech lunch. And a screw pyrolyzer is another example. So that's uh, just a few examples of some of the common um, pyrolysis methods for making char. So I've put up a few resources here um, where you can learn more about those and others. And next month, we'll have part three of our carbonization series to talk about some of the recent advances. Um, so I just want to thank everyone at, uh, for attending Asante Sana and look forward to continuing the discussion. Thanks so much.